In fact, there are a few things more beautiful to the human soul than good design. When it's good design in all aspects, stirring, um, stirring to the senses, fit for its function, elegant in its material choice, and gentle in its manufacturing, we can't help but feel the lights and the design to do at least as well in our next design. So what is Van Rupi in a nutshell? Just a quick recap. Van Rupi is learning from and then emulating natural forms, um, processes, as well as systems to create more sustainable designs. The core idea is that nature has already solved many of the problems we are grappling with. Energy, food production, climate control, benign chemistry, transportation, collaboration, and more. Mimicking these earth static designs can help humans leapfrog to technologies that sip energy, shape material use, reject toxins, and work as a system to create conditions conducive to life. Now, to emphasize that phrase, to create conditions conducive to life, which is a key phrase that you can see um, being repeated throughout. So, given its depth and breadth, how does one categorize our mimicry? Is it a design discipline? Advantage of science, a problem solving method, a sustainable sustainability ethos, a movement, a response toward nature, a new way of viewing that we invite a person, or is it actually all of these? And how does that mimicry fit into other design paradigms? Because of this broad range, our mimicry contributes both practically and philosophically to many of the eco design paradigms devised in the past 30 years. Um, these include the natural step, uh, the natural capitalism, cradle to cradle, ecological design, and the living building challenge, which some of you might be familiar with, hopefully. And so I'm going to one spread, um, yeah, I did say that. Now, throughout history, architects have looked to nature for inspiration, for building forms and approaches to decoration. We're here to look beyond the aesthetics and into the functional processes. But particular aspects of nature as source book that is distinct from the majority of architectural references to the natural world. In the intention of and the key of applying this to architecture is whether the design engages with the function delivered by a particular natural adaptation. To move from shadow to deep mimicry requires to engage in an ongoing conversation with the model organism we have chosen to use and to mimic what we learn on at least three levels. Now these three levels are the three levels of biomimicry. The first level of biomimicry is the mimicking of natural form. For instance, you may mimic the hooks and bodice of an owl feather to create a fabric that opens anywhere along its surface. Or you can imitate the frayed ed edges of this um, that the grass the owl is assigned as flat. Copying feather design is just a beginning because it may or may not yield something sustainable. Deeper biomimicry as a second level, which is a mimicking of natural processes, or how it is made. The owl feather self assembles at body temperature without toxins or high pressures by way of nature's chemistry. At the third level, is the mimicking of natural, um, natural ecosystems. The owl feather is grace, gracefully nested. It's part of an owl that is part of a forest, that is part of a biome, that is part of a sustaining biosphere. In the same way, our owl inspired fabric must be part of a larger economy um, that works to resource rather than to keep the earth and its people. If you make a biome inspired fabric, and using green chemistry, but you have workers weaving it in sweatshops and loading it onto polluting spirit trucks and shipping it long distances, then you completely miss the point. So a lot of biomimicry is um, uh, very much an ethos. To mimic natural, natural systems, you must ask how each product fits. Is it necessary? Is it beautiful? Is a part of a nourishing food web of industries and can it be transported, sold, and reabsorbed in ways that foster a forest like economy? If we find them at these three levels natural form, natural processes, as well as ecosystem we'll begin to do what 
all biodiverse organisms have learned to do, which is create conditions conducive to life. Creating conditions conducive to life is not optional, it's a rite of passage for any organism that manages to fit in here over the long haul. If we want to keep coming home to this place, we'll, ne we'll need to learn from our predecessors how to filter air, clean water, build, build soil, how to keep the habitat lush and livable. It's what good neighbors do. Now, it's important to mention that biomimicry is not new to the human species. Um, there was a time when our survival dependent, dependent on noticing and mimicking successful organisms. This latest appearance of biomimicry is not an, an invention, it's a remembering and a reconnecting. Now, enough of the romanticized wording. Um, how do we find biomimicry? Practically speaking. Life's principles. These are the principles of applying biomimicry. Um, not unlike the principles we have for design, which is unity, balance, hierarchy, scale, and all the others. And the small circle on your the top left outlines what, uh, what the life principles are, design lessons from nature. And if you can't read, I'll read it for you. Life on Earth is interconnected and interdependent. Life's principles represent the overarching patterns found among, among species surviving and thriving on Earth. Life integrates and optimizes these strategies to create conditions conducive to life. The set of principles is a result of and subject to the operating conditions of the plant. Found in the, the blue uh, arrow at the bottom. Um, and these are sunlight, water, gravity, dynamic non equilibrium, limits and boundaries, and psychic processes. Life's operating conditions reminds us of what is driving the adaptations. The center of the circle, um, in the middle where that little plant is, is both the aspirational goal and the emergent property of these principles, which is, take a guess, creating conditions conducive to life. Um, then we have the principles all around it, and which are clustered both in similarity and relatedness, as well as with a degree of hierarchy. You'll see the major ones are at the um, outskirts and then the inside ones are the sort of sub sub um, categories. Um, just as no principle stands alone, all principles are interconnected, and one is able to rearrange the sub principles and the master principles according to how, how you're applying it. Through these principles, nature not only acts as a mentor with its aspirational ideals, but also as a model with its innovative strategies and a measure in the form of sustain a sustainable benchmark, which is how these principles would be used. Um, and it says there at the top. So as a mentor, as a model, and as a measure. One of the best ways to understand biomimicry is through example. And I've chosen a select few, hopefully it won't be too long to get through it. Um, concentrating specifically on its application in architecture as well as design. And keeping in mind that true biomimicry exists in three levels, the ones that the form, the process, and the ecosystems. I do have to mention that you'll find that a lot of the existing examples focus on only one of these levels, um, which isn't wrong, um, so to speak, but one should always aim to um, to encompass all three of these levels for it to be true biomimicry. Um, although this can be quite challenging. The examples are either driven by biological abstraction, so a specific organism, a process, or a, an ecosystem found in nature, or sometimes it's simply a particular life principle. And just, let's quickly go through those life principles, um, because a lot of a lot of biomimicry um, inspired uh, designs are actually purely driven by these life principles. Um, these are to evolve to survive to uh, be a resource, material and energy efficient, uh, adapt to changing conditions, integrate development with growth, be locally attuned and responsive, and use life-friendly chemistry. And um, I'm not going to go through all the, the subcategories. Um, they're just, uh, yeah, 
extra explanation of the, the main principle each time. Right, examples. <clears throat> the hydrological center for the University of Namibia. A uh, model of the Namibian beetle. The Namibian beetle lives in a desert, at, um, in a desert, desert that rarely sees any rainfall. The intricate design of the beetle shell provides the beetle with the essential nutrients and water necessary to survive in such a climate. By taking advantage of the frequent morning fog, the bumps in the beetle's shell, which are hydrophilic, um, water attracting, along with alternate parts of the shell, which are hydrophobic, water repelling. The hydrophobic parts of the shell act like channels or ropes for water and moisture. During the hot day, the beetle is exposed to the radiating sun, and its black shell absorbs a lot of the heat. When nightfall approaches, it comes out from below the ground and climbs, climbs to the top of the mound and waits for the morning to come. Because the beetle's temperature is a lot warmer um, than its surrounding, it's a beacon for moisture. When the morning fog rolls, water droplets from the fog are combined and collected on the beetle's shell. When the water droplets have formed, the beetle tilts back, I think the image, and the droplets run down the channels or hydrophobic um, growths and into its mouth. Architect Matthew Parkes was inspired to mimic the same type of technology into a building design to turn water droplets, droplets collected from the fog and to use it as a uh, well, and to from the fog into usable water. The building in the, is there, I'm sorry, the image is a bit blurry, is a series of pots and um, they're positioned behind a tall, slightly curved line, line of mesh screen, which is the front thing there, which is used to collect water. The nylon mesh wall is orientated towards the ocean so that the, um, it can adequately capture as much moisture as possible from the fogs that come um, from the ocean front. The droplets collect on the mesh screens and because of its shape and vertical orientation, um, again mimicked from the, the beetle, the water naturally runs down the mesh into gutter system located at the bottom of the screens. The water is then transported through the gutters and into um, large systems that keep the water in an appropriate um, cooler temperature so that the water doesn't evaporate. Second one, um, this is the, the East Gate Centre in Zimbabwe um, by Zimbabwe Architect Mobius. And the, we're, he looks specifically at as the termite mount um, as a source of inspiration. The termite mounds were made to protect the nesting and royal areas, as well as the fungus cones, which is the primary, primary um, food source. Um, this fungus can only grow and be sufficient if it's kept, kept at a, a very exact um, temperature for these bees. Um, the temperatures outside of the mound fluctuate greatly um, during the day, so specifically in the, when the mound is found in desert areas. And um, the temperature is able to drop drastically at night as well. So how does the termites keep this constant temperature within this mound? The temperatures, um, so what, what the termite does to regulate the nest temperature is open and close specific vents, which are precisely um, placed in the mound to regulate air within the mound itself. With a system of carefully adjusted convection currents, air is sucked in at the lower part of the mound. You can see that it's in down into enclosures with the mud walls um, and up through a channel to the peak of the termite mound. It was this type of behavior of termites that inspired um, Arctic Mercurius in his design of the East Gate Center in Zimbabwe. The outside air is drawn into the building by means of inlets at the base of the building, and this air is either warm or cool depending on the temperature of the building mass. And the building mass is cooler than the air and um, the ends of the structures will um, also be cooled. Um, the air is then directed upwards towards chimneys, but on its way up to the top, it passes into the building, in, into the building floors and offices. And the building is actually made, um, yeah, so cooling the whole area before it um, leaves back up. The building is actually made up of um, three parts, two exterior structures, 
and then there's also um, a glass center that connects them together, which is um, that passage in between the two. The glass space in the center also participates in natural convection and is usually open to local breezes, um, sort of like creating a valley. And these breezes follow the somewhat familiar principle of temperature regulation. But what is remarkable about um, Okay, yeah, so this example, we've, we've heard of this, this kind of temperature regulation in architecture. Um, what is remarkable about this is the scale that is, um, um, at which it is applied. And this is with no other con um, conventional HVAC system. So no air pumps, no nothing else for this. And this is in Zimbabwe, where it's very hot. So um, as well as the intricacy of the system, and if you have a chance, go and look at it, because there's, there's much more to it than what I'm saying now. Another um, really good example, um, also Mick Pierce as well as for a collaboration with other architects and engineers, and this is um, in Melbourne, Australia, is the Council House 2. And they've used quite a few natural models, um, they're based on quite a few natural models, including um, tree and the Malayan um, skin. So that's the, some images of the building. For the H um, the CH2T, the most compelling model for the building of the future of nature. The diagram over here, to the left, um, was developed to visually capture the many natural analogies of the design, such as bark, skin, bronchi, and all the others that you see here on the right mentioned. This was based on the concept of synergy. The building comprises of many overlapping systems each being more than the sum of its parts. Building fabric, people, engineering systems, energy, flows, natural and man-made landscape all combine to form an interrelated whole, in the case of this building. Um, now, this building also has a lot of information and actually is very well documented, so I would suggest having a look at it um, if you get a chance. I had to um, sort of Limit what I'm showing here, so I'm just going to point out some fascinating design elements within this building. Um, the horizontal form of the um, CH2 building was developed by incorporating basic features of the main skin, composed of the epidermis, the skin on the right, and, uh, which is the outer skin, and then the, the dermis, which is the inner skin. Um, the outer skin allows breathing and interaction with the external environment. And this is seen on the eastern and western facade of the building. While well, the internal skin protects the internal condition space. Uh, the the dermis is the outer zone that houses the stairs, the lifts, the ducts, balconies, shade screens, and foliage, with the inner line defining the extent of the compartment. And we can sort of see what's happening there. Um, all structures within the dermis were kept by the steel frames. The outer epidermis provides the micro environment, including the primary sun and air control for the building, while helping to create a semi enclosed micro, um, micro environment for the user's outlet. Um, other very cool um, design elements of this building, which I'm not really going to go detailed into it, um, is the bar line facade. And the ventilation stacks. Here it looks quite interesting as well. The north, um, the north facade, which is the, the one on the left, um, has you'll see the windows are larger at the bottom, where there's less uh, because of, of the streets and skyscrapers and all that. There's less sunlight over the sunlight that reaches there. And then towards the, the top of the building, the windows get smaller and smaller because obviously there's more direct sunlight there. And um, also the look of the, having black um, on the facade to absorb um, the sun, while the other facade has, is white, so to reflect the, the sun, um, the heat. And then you have um, chill panels and beams for cooking purposes. And then also these very interesting shower towers, which, um, yeah, very interesting. Um, also, what's What's very important with this building is it makes use of and interacts with the psychic processes around it. Um, such as here you have um, day, day mode, how the building functions during the day and how it um, 
um, maximizes um, all, all elements of during the day of signing and the different orientations of the sun and all that. And so day and night and the changing seasons as well. So it makes use of all these cycle processes, which is one of the uh, very important of the life principles. <clears throat> so there you've got the day mode, the night mode, the sun mode, and then the wind mode. Thank you. 
and adapt it for the design principle. So you can start a natural model and then you abstract it into your design to design principles and you brainstorm potential applications and then you would emulate um, in nature, uh, using nature strategies and then evaluate against the life principles. So um, yeah, your life principles at the end of the process would be your, your measure. So you would sort of check us. Um, the other approach, uh, which is I think more, more used than the biology to design, is um, challenge to biology. And here you would identify a problem or a challenge that you have, whether it's um, uh, water pipes are getting clogged because of some growth or something like that. And you would see what, what model in nature um, can resolve this problem. So it's identifying the challenge and then interpret the design brief, and then discover natural models that, um, that can solve this problem. And then you would, again, abstract design principles, emulate, and evaluate again using the life principles. All right, and um, just to help you understand that, I'm going to show you the expand my, my practical. <coughs> Um, now, with the practical, the learning, the learning is really practical. You apply to your subject, so you, you choose your subject, and this is through Biography South Africa. Um, and you choose a subject and then you apply it to, to that subject. And um, I chose it, um, I am doing my practical through John Barrett, who is here somewhere. And um, he's got an eco village outside of Human's um, and he's developing an eco village there. And so I based my, my library through CAC um, in a specific and the eco village would have different um, from home culture um, villages as well as different um, houses, ecological houses from tree houses to, to um, all sorts of different examples. And so the, the, the one um, that I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on is um, a tree house or what I call an eco pot in a specific site on um, John's um, farm. And um, so what happens is you would then define your challenge. Now my challenge was to design a module or unit of a human dwelling and to facilitate the integration of man and the environment and an eco part to form part of the holistic community within the self-sustaining regenerative system in the nature of um, So just abbreviated, it's an eco part a module unit of dwelling or shelter. <clears throat> From there, I got a quite a complex, um, and then I got a quite a complex taxonomy. Okay, from there, you would look at what model you want to use um, that would help you design this. So you would ask, what what does my design have to do? It needs to capture water, perhaps. It needs to um, produce energy. It needs to house people, obviously. Um, and then you would ask, how does nature do this? <clears throat> and then you look at the biology. Okay, for this um, for this example, I based it. I looked at the aloe um, because it's prominent in that area, and I also looked at natural shelters within that area. So things like nests and burrows, um, and yeah, so and shells and things like that. And then. A lot of biology goes behind this, and you do a lot of research on the biology. <clears throat> and I'm just going to show you a few of um, a few of the design principles. So the abstracted biology into design principles that I came up with. The que one of the questions was, how does the aloe stay put or attached? Because my building is going to have to be attached somehow. Uh, the strategy of the aloe is to make use of the root system to anchor itself. Um, the mechanism, which is how it's able to do the strategy, is the seminal roots grow from those of a young shoot. These roots are supplemented by an extensive system of crown roots. These extended lateral branching plant growth, which permeate the soil, provide the anchorage and support to the plant. The plant's root system accounts for a greater percentage of the plant's total biomass than that of the shoot above the ground system. This root shoot ratio is maintained as the plant grows. Okay, so that's the biology. <coughs> now you, you, need, you needed to take this biology and translate it into a uh, design principle. 
and you'll do that by getting rid of all the biology in the underdog <clears throat> So the design principle for this one that I came up with is a subterranean anchorage system which accounts for a great percentage of the structure's total mass. That's the Nadabab-Ron system. The system consists of lateral branching with subsimilar sub components which permit subterranean composition at every level of fractal geometry, multi-scale attachment. And um, thus secure, securing the structure and providing anchorage. Uh, another example is how can the aloe capture water? The dissociative strategy um, is that the plant's leaves are shaped and arranged in such a way as to capture water. <clears throat> it's uh, boat shaped in cross, cross section. Uh, the leaves are boat shaped and arranged in rosette and acts as the effective funnels through which rainwater and moisture are collected and channeled to the plant's roots. So here my design principle um, is make use of surfaces as well as manipulate shape of design fabric component to effectively and most efficiently capture rainwater here. Um, and our nice exercise that we, um, John and myself, did on the farm was actually dissect an aloe, um, a fallen over aloe, was really good. <laughs> <laughs> and we the structure of it and, um, and from that I did a few sketches and I, I also played around and took photos and um, overlaid, uh, overlaid my drawings on it. And it's amazing what you, what you, what you can find out. Um, specifically related to the strategy of, of capturing water um, is that the leaves are actually or, um, uh, angled away from each other at 137 um, degrees, and this is apparently a norm in most plants. And this is to so that um, all the leaves can capture water, and then it's got to make um, the core, the, it all gathers into one um, <coughs> stem. And it also grows, the leaves grow um, proportioned to the Fibonacci sequence, which is so amazing. Uh, another one, how does the aloe prevent structural failure? The strategy, uh, specialized cells which make up the plant tissue are adapted for support which prevents structural failure. The mechanism, uh, collenchyma uh, cells, have um, unevenly thickened primary cells, so okay, that's quite a bit of biology there. And then my design principle is to use forgiving or tolerant materials which allow for movement with an uncontrollable force, rather than to oppose your resistance by imposing rigidity in order to prevent structural failure. <clears throat> and then I did mention I looked at some natural uh, shelters as examples as well. And here I, um, the question was how does the mecha, which is a, a, a bird, generate heat energy um, in its nest? The strategy, um, certain megapods, large round grain Australian birds, use the heat generated by composting organic matter to hatch their eggs. The bird creates this incubator compost by collecting various decomposing material from organic waste. Aerobic bacteria are responsible for the process of turning organic waste into compost. And these organ organisms thrive in the most in the moist environment with access to oxygen and combination materials. And so what I deduced from that was um, to make use of organic waste material to create a compost heater in order to generate heat used to heat water or other massive functions. These are all experiments, okay? One from the other. Many of the parents' approaches to environmentally sustainable... Oh yeah, just back to my computer that I had. Okay, so this is a process and you know, it's supposed to be a six month pack, but it's sort of a, become a uh, much longer thing. <laughs> and John Emily has got a lot of patience with me, and, um, but it's, it's been very interesting, and um, hopefully, we'll be able to build this eco bottom line. And um, so, hopefully, I, I don't want to give away, yeah, it's been with designing and sketching and all that, but I don't want to give that away um, at this stage. Um, yeah. But I did want to show you how the extracting of the, bi the biological abstraction would happen. So many current approaches to environmentally sustainable architecture are based on mitigation. Bionicri suggests that it is possible to go further than this. 
and for buildings and cities to be regenerative. In the hope that buildings will cease to be static consumers and can become net producers of useful resources. The intention is therefore to transcend the mimicking of natural forms and attempt to understand the principles that lie behind these forms and systems. Then we can look for opportunities to create works of architecture that are um, celebratory as well as being radically more resource efficient. The dynamic approach seeks major advice at all stages of design, from scoping to creating to evaluation, to infuse life system systemic wisdom into the design of everything from harvest to cities. And as promised, the resources and references. Um, very good book, Hard to Get All of Here, you need to order it. Is the Vinyrkine Architecture by Michael Thomas. Um, one I do have is Vinyrkine Innovation and Inspired by Nature. And yeah, those are the websites Vinyrkine South Africa and then there's the Global Vinyrkine Thank you. Whoa. Cancer, we, we have 
our cities don't know how to stop growing. There's no idea of what they, what the purpose of of their growth is other than to grow, yeah. and um, they have um, uh, commandeered all manners of organs to to serve their purpose and grow and grow and grow. And all of us are kind of nodding our heads internally or externally. But the question is, if this is the fact, and if we're living in this giant tumor, is there, how much point is there to us trying to make our buildings look like gherkins or grasshoppers or plant mm -hmm. beetles? If it's, or is it all just a waste of time? I, don't think no. your answer's, I hope your answer is going to be no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my question. It wouldn't be creating gherkins and things. It would be more, let's say, okay. saying cancer. Maybe look at how how do we want blood cells, or how do how do they how do they um, combat these cancer cells? What's the key? Yeah. So looking at looking to nature for that. That is your challenge. Where in in nature do they do they deal with this? And you take it from there. Mm -hmm. Maybe to finish off, can you introduce John to us? I, I've heard of him, I don't know what he looks like. John
Well, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's twofold. I think you're going to have your more techno advanced age, which is evolving, but you still have your very earth based people who are you know, kind of rebelling and saying it's not working. Yeah. And you're going to have a more cyborg future and a more ground based one. And you know, it's a choice of where you wish to put your energies and what you're going to latch onto. So I think there will be more of a divide, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's the individual's choice. I think more and more people are realizing that we don't need to take a few steps back because somewhere along the line we've done something wrong. And a lot of people have you know that they want to go back to basics um, per se. But even, even if we do go to the, uh, if there is techno based or development or growth rather than hmm, more natural fundamental development, if those techno development can be environmented by it, so a set towards something better. Yes. Um, if there if there aren't any other questions, I, I would like to hijack the meeting for a quick commercial break <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and a short snap survey. But if there's other questions, I'll hold. Uh, I've got a comment. Um, I don't think we must take this biomimicry as kind of new lifestyle. We only become aware of biomimicry through our technology, through our microscopes, through you know, advanced science. And it's a way of discovering further sciences and further technologies. It's not, I don't see it as, as a new lifestyle, but it's a, 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 an evolving science that we can uh, discover things that uh, uh, nature has produced them. That's quite fantastic, but uh, don't, you know, it's, not a, it's not a fact or a movement, it's, it's a science. Don't you think the aim, or the you know, main aim at the end of the day, would be to convince those more technological uh, approach or um, driven individuals to see how their strengths could benefit the other extreme um, and convince them that together you they come up with the best outcome at the end of the day rather than you know fighting each other the whole time convince the two to work together like the comment was just made the science helped to um, discover all these natural um, solutions that you can find. Yeah, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a lot of uh, technology inspired by biomimicry. And biomimicry is it's the, the, the technology of biology. Mm -hmm. like no, there's, no, there's no conflict. But no, it's, it's not just, it's not a social movement. Uh, I don't think one should get confused that it's all back to nature. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't think it's that at all. That might be a, a particular way some people might move, but it, it can be used in any science, it can be used in outer space, whatever. Well, it's back to nature in the sense that nature needs to be your, 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 your driving, your model, your mentor. It's a source, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think then, I'm going to try my commercial break now. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, other than thanking Philip for, for putting these talks together, Philip's, I mean, he's a professional architect and then he finds time in, in his life to organize these things. These things happen once a month, and uh, once a month, Philip finds a brilliant speaker, almost as brilliant as Wendeka, to come talk to us about exciting new things in the world of design and the world of the built environment. So, so, so Philip, thanks very much for that. But can you also say, uh, actually, uh, we talk twice a month, you know, every, every Twice a month, yeah. I, I said once a month. Twice a month. Yeah, we've month. got the habitat, which is this talk, yeah. and then we've got the architect and craft, which is more about building stuff and how to work with materials in like a design way, not, you know, putting a brick in the But, but you can and follow us on Twitter at um, ECIA. Uh, ECIA. Uh, ECIA. Mm -hmm. ECIAPE, you can follow us, and you, we're on Facebook at Eastgate Institute of Architects, and all of these talks that Phyllis put in together are, are, are on there, and they're, they're very, very exciting. Um, so, 
all of all of us that are here, uh, you, you're welcome to attend. You're, you're, you're either architects or you're friends of the architectural profession. You're very, very welcome here. Many of you are familiar to these tools. The other thing, that was my commercial break. But the other thing was my SNAP survey. Um, and I just want to know, hands up, anybody that would not be interested in hearing when Deca, when Deca come back and talk next year about the progress with the project? Hands up, anybody not interested? 100% <laughs> interest. Um, so, <laughs> but, but then, um, also, anybody not interested in um, attending a talk that John Barrett may give us on his... Honey will equal a business job. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody not interested? <laughs> okay, um, uh, John, if you wouldn't mind, I want to ask for to, to, to make arrangements with you. Is that okay? Because I, I saw a lot of ears prick up when we mentioned the Honey will, and I think it may be quite interesting for us to hear if, if you're okay with that. Thank you very much. Hmm. Thank you very much. But, it's a, um, we, we only choose the top speakers in town, so um, we, we have to arrange them um, in, in order. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending, and we'll see you again here in two weeks' time on Friday at 12.